uh, spending some time with us here. I'm joined by fellow health coach, Annika. Hey, Annika, how are you? Good, thank you. Awesome. And we have Richard Wolf. Hey, Rich, how are you hey. doing tonight? Rick, I'm doing great. Really excited about being here tonight. Absolutely. It's been a long time coming. Real pleasure to have you joining us for this conversation. Just for our audience, um, real quick, uh, don't blush, Rich. I, just a little quick bio on you, if I could. Sure. Uh, are an entrepreneur. You are the owner of Med Fitness. You're a registered dietitian. Yeah. Uh, you are a fitness consultant uh, to mm -hmm. many different people, um, a trainer, a mm -hmm. runner. Uh, I remember, Rich, I don't know if you remember, um, you, I attended a conference, you were the keynote speaker at oh, that yes. conference many years ago. <laughs> many years ago, yeah, boy, yeah, we were young men. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so it's great to have you here. I'm going to, for our audience, Rich, right up front, I'm going to start adding the value to this conversation. I want to give them your website. Sure. Medfitnessprogram.com, perhaps Katie or Kate could also put that in. And among other parts of, of your website, I want to just highlight the learning center that you have there and the right. articles, Rich, that you have posted. Those are such right. fantastic articles. It's really a great uh, place to get to know you a little bit more. And I have to say, Rich, I think you wrote those articles for me. <laughs> <laughs> they are, they, they, they ticked off the trifecta for me. They are science-based, yeah. all evidence-based with references yeah. and everything. But you also, I love how you take a brief history of you know, how things used to be and how things are evolving and where we're at now in all yeah. things, strength, strength training and health yeah. management. I love that perspective. Yeah. And then uh, the real brass ring, such clear, concise recommendations. So thank you mm -hmm. for those articles. And uh, Annika, I think you also enjoyed reading uh, the articles on uh, Richard's website. Yeah, there's just um, such great information. I feel like I learned a lot, even though they were, you know, Quick reads, concise, um, just a lot of great information. Makes yeah. me want to go uh, move to Illinois and train there. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So, <All> the <laughs> so yeah. hopefully, besides what we cover here in this conversation for our viewers, um, check out medfitnessprogram.com. Check out uh, those articles just to start your uh, investigation into this area. Mm. Um, okay. Again, we've been looking forward to this discussion, Rich, because strength training is an area, let's face it, it tends to get shortchanged. Right. Uh, and I, you don't need me to tell you that. Um, whenever you're discussing improving health through lifestyle changes, it's such a big oversight because of the impact that it yeah. can have. And we're going to talk about that here. I will just um, acknowledge that in our viewership, whether you're watching this live or uh, after the fact, as always, we have a range of people uh, in terms of their experience with HMR in our audience. So some of you watching, this may be an introduction to the topic, and that's great. Let the conversation marinate for you and see where you can take it. Others of you may be in action with some strength training. I think we're going to actually hear from some people, Annika. Um, I will just say for people for whom this is a newer behavior, if you decide to add this to uh, your routine, it's always prudent to consult with your physician beforehand. So I'll just say that right up front. All right, Rich, on, in those articles, you have a number of like zinger statements, really powerful statements. You like yeah. to quote from the research, from different noted authors in the field, mm -hmm. the importance of exercise overall, but also in particular strength training. Just yeah. up front, Rich, yeah. how important is strength training for the average person? Just like looking at it from the helicopter view. Yeah, I'd say it's 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 one of the top three or four health habits that people need to keep their eyes on. When we look at sort of global public health mm -hmm. and the pandemic that we are living through, which is a state of chronic disease throughout the United States, which we seem to do a good job ignoring, but uh, a lot of the lack of activity, metabolic dysfunction, um, and a host of other chronic illnesses are linked to muscle loss. We didn't know that one generation ago. Mm. And it's only been the last 30 to 40 years that scientists and now health professionals are embracing this as a uh, sort of a, a life part of lifestyle medicine, which is to strength train. Yes. Yeah. Really well said. I love that. It's a great uh, top down view of just how important this behavior is. Um, I will say, and as people, if they read your articles and we're going to talk about it today, you know, we're talking mostly about strength training. Um, but I would just acknowledge that in the program, even without uh, the addition of strength training, 
you know this, Rich. Um, yeah. Like you've certainly heard this a thousand times. People do report increases in it, their energy, feeling stronger, uh, feeling more vital, more endurance, more stamina, whatever word you want to use. And right. that's without strength training. Yeah. But when you add the strength training in, it's just yeah. another method of enhancing all of those positive effects yeah. that so many people are already experiencing in the right. program. So it's almost like a synergy, Rich. Does that sort of resonate yeah. with you? Oh, so absolutely. Yeah. Very synergistic. Yeah. I mean, the, the physical activity in general with strength training and how that dovetails into healthy eating, they're all connected. You know, they're all interrelated. Yeah. Um, so uh, we talk frequently about that at MedFitness. Yes. Right. right. Great. Absolutely. So depending on, you know, how to people, what they're motivated to do, it could be an incredible addition to what you're already doing in the program. If this isn't something that you've uh, started to practice mm -hmm. now, I think that we have to get the elephant out of the room when we're talking about strength training. Yeah. This is an area where there's an awful lot of misinformation out there, uh, a lot of misunderstanding of the basics. So right. let's start by tackling some of the myths right up front, if we could uh, just yes. get those out of the way. But I'm curious, Rich, you work with so many people and you have through the years. Do you still have to help people to rethink their views on strength training? Do people sort of have it right or is there still yeah. a lot of confusion out there? Yeah, well, what's surprising to me is two things. One is that when people come to us, they're very receptive to what we tell them. We, I mean, we deliver mm -hmm. in a very prescriptive dose. So this is what it is, and this is what we're doing. No one really questions us on it. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing that is surprising, and it has actually gotten worse, Rick, in the last uh, decade or so, is that people walk in having no idea what to do when it comes to strength training, just completely lost. They may be their act of doing other stuff, which is great but they have just skipped over because they know they know nothing and um, they're realizing they need some, some clarity around the to do's. Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. So, you know, I, I personally, Annika, you too, we people who do do strength training, but even the brief conversation we had last week in anticipation of this conversation, Rich, yeah. you, there were some things that I thought, yeah, you know what, that that's, a little different than what I was thinking. So it's right. really, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping people can bring like a real beginner's mind to this because some of this stuff might even seem a little paradoxical on the face of it and right. the suggestions. But let's let's talk about some of the myths. Anika, you've shared with me in your work with people in the program that um, people do sort of present some of the reasons why they're not interested in, in taking on strength training in any way, shape or form. What are some of the things that you've heard that prevent people from being open to this? Yeah, I think that one of the top myths or barriers is that it just takes too much time. You know, um, a few things, you know, things that we've heard, uh, you know, if I'm going to spend the time in the gym, I'm going to have, you know, an hour to spend. I want to get the biggest bang for my buck with calories. And what does that typically mean? Lots of cardio. So I think that one myth is that it takes too much time. Yeah. 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 Rich, this was the area actually right. that I, that like I had a sense of it, but you made, said some really strong things about how less can actually be more. Can you talk about this a little bit more? Yeah. Well, I think it begins Rick with the understanding that this is not about checking the strength training box. My last article, I wrote about how the outcome matters more than the behavior. So this is not about going through an hour long workout and saying, good, I did it now move on. You, what matters is intensity. And so if you're going to, if you're going to run as hard as you can, Rick, it, you, you know, that it's easier to run as hard as you can for 10 minutes versus 60 minutes. Mm -hmm. And so when that intensity goes up, what happens is you develop what we call a training stimulus to the muscle. And so the more the intensity, the greater the stimulus, the response is linked to the intensity of the stimulus, not the volume of the workout. You could work really hard for 10 minutes, get exponentially more out of your workout than spending an hour strength training. So the, one of the biggest mistakes people make when they strength train is that they don't work hard enough. And so they don't understand that intensity matters more than anything else. You can lift rocks. If you work hard, you will get stronger. It doesn't matter what you're working against. Your muscle doesn't know what it's contracting against. So mm -hmm. intensity matters. And thankfully, because of that, brief workouts work really well. My mm -hmm. workout is 20 to 25 minutes once or twice a week. That's it. Wow. wow. Yeah. That's 
Awesome. I, I want to hear a little bit more about that. But Annika, I think that we need to be very careful with if we're putting this less is more soundbite out there, we need to make sure that people know it of the program don't sort of conflate more is better and less is more and get and really get confused about this yeah. whole thing. <laughs> right. so more is better with the food. Yeah. Less, right. uh, maybe more with the resistance training. That's exactly right. Yeah. Rich, Rich can I build on what you just said? The, yeah. the two workouts uh, at your facility for 20 to 25 minutes in the entire week, you yeah. had uh, introduced a soundbite that was awesome the, yeah. the percent rule. Can you share with our viewers what exactly the one percent rule means? Yeah. So when we think about when we think about any health habit, Rick, we're, we're always sort of questioning. Well, what's in it for me? What's my return on this? Whether I'm eating an apple or taking a walk, whatever it is, people do the same thing with strength training. And so when you boil down strength training and you look at all the metabolic and the health benefits that occur in a very brief amount of time, that twenty minute workout is going to generate metabolic benefits health benefits for the next seven days. This is not a behavior I need to do daily. I'm getting, I'm translating that 20 minute investment into seven days of returns before I go do it again next week. So it's once or twice a week. Um, and when you break down, you know, 20 minutes times two, 40 minutes, that's 168 hours a week. That's under 1% of your week that you're investing to get benefits for the following seven days, which is just, you know, incredibly efficient. It is the most efficient health habit there is. <laughs> so I love that. I love that. So with resistance training, less is more. And you've just sort of underscored the point that in terms of it, your investment of time, it may give you the biggest return on right. your investment of time. If you do even just a little bit of strength training, that's, that's awesome. exactly right. I mean, love what that. Annika said about the calories, um, you know, we, 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 we don't, in the HMR program, we don't track these uh, outcomes, but there is this sort of post-workout energy expenditure that's linked to skeletal muscle recovering and rebuilding from the training stimulus. And so that happens for three to four days after the workout. So you're three days later, Rick, your body is still recovering from that workout using calories in that recovery process. So this is about 7% of basal metabolism, which is about two thirds of your total energy needs. So take your weight, you know, for, for, if we're using the HMR numbers, you know, take your weight times 10 or 11, multiply that by 0. 0.66 times that by 0. 0.7, you'll get the extra calories you're burning. Now we're not tracking those, but still those are real calories that are being expent in the recovery process that does not happen with general aerobic and cardiovascular activity. So. It, Boy, there are very few things in the weight loss and weight management arena that land as sounding like too good to be true, magic, yeah. you know, use whatever uh, phrase you want. Right. That is as close as it gets right there. You do yeah. some resistance training and your body is continuing to burn calories long, days after. Days um, after, right. right. All right, Annika, let's make sure we bring that back up. As, as you know, we have people who will join uh, this conversation mm -hmm. A little bit later in the, the time we have here, Rich. So that's such an important point. We want to make sure we bring that back up. Mm. And I could give us another myth you've heard sure. about strength training. Yeah. So another common myth is that it takes too much effort. Yeah. You know, I think uh, right. people often think, well, I'm not the person who likes to lift heavy things or right. I can't do it because it seems so out of reach. Yes. Right. Yeah. So that's a big one. That's a good one. So I, well, I would agree. I'd say if you're doing a conventional workout of three sets, 10 to 15 reps, um, you know, split routines, you're training five, six days a week for an hour at a time. I'd say it does take too much. It does take too much effort because who wants to suffer over five hours? Nobody does. <laughs> I mean, my suffering threshold is really low here. So for me, and I tell my clients this all the time. I'd, I'd rather get this over with sooner versus later. I'm not in here because I want to, you know, because I love the muscle burn. I hate the muscle burn, so quite honestly. So uh, so when we look at the evidence on this, it was really Dr. Bill Evans at Tufts University back in the 80s who sort of brought light to this issue of intensity and short workouts. And so he showed how if you take older adults in their 70s, 80s, and 90s and and get them to train 
at a high level of effort over very short workouts, they get all these benefits that we have never seen before in older adults. Back in the day when I was growing up, the mindset was that older adults shouldn't waste their time lifting weights because the evidence shows there's no benefits. That's because we had them lifting soup cans and it just wasn't enough to stimulate their muscles. But when they work hard, very brief amounts of time, they get unbelievable benefits. And of course, then, then I can say to you, Rick, okay, what tell you tell me if we're going to train your legs and it takes six minutes to do that, can you work as hard as you can? If I'm coaching you work for six minutes, everybody says yes, because mm. they know the alternative is this arduous, painful, long death march that is in the gym every day. So amazing. It, yeah. Talk about a positive message. So, yeah. so Annika, those two myths, take that. <laughs> <laughs> Less time than you think, yeah. less effort, because it's not all, a lot of time of working hard and uh, biggest return on your investment. That's, it's, it's just yeah. awesome. Yeah. Um, Let me add one more nugget, Rick. So you know, people please. hear that and they say, this guy's got to be wrong. What, what is he saying? This is upside down. You know, Everyone's familiar with the idea of doing multiple sets. If I'm going to train my chest, I got to do three or four chest press. I go three or four dumbbell flies. I got to do, I got all this volume and stuff. When in fact, that whole concept was born in the 1940s on a study by a physician in the army who was rehabbing servicemen from World War II and, and they had orthopedic issues and he developed this training protocol that got published in the early 50s. And he, he used a three set approach. There was nothing in the literature at this time. So he used this three set approach. Hmm. Years later, he, re he reveals that, well, the first two sets were just kind of get them loosened up and warmed up. And then we worked hard on the third set. And now when we look carefully at the evidence, that first set, as long as it's hard and training to that high intensity, we see these mind boggling benefits that are unnecessary with a third or fourth or fifth rep set, which is so common in today's culture. So wow. again, less is more. It just yeah. lies in the face of what one might intuitively think on this. Yeah. It's such a positive message, Rich. Really yeah. great. Yeah. Annika, I didn't mean to skip over the thought starter. Um, can you? Um, yeah. Review that a little bit, and then that will inform some of the additional comments that we make here. Yeah, and I think that um, people have already been answering in the comments a little bit here, but um, for those who are just tuning in, um, you know, we want to hear from you guys. Um, if you are doing strength training, um, why? You know, what do you get out of it? What's a what's a big benefit for you yeah. in incorporating strength training? Um, you know, we asked the the Facebook community earlier this week to share some of their top benefits that um, they're receiving. And we got a, a lot of, a big variety of answers, but, you know, of course, muscle strength, of course, uh, toning was a big one, but yep. also confidence was a, was a top one. So um, I know there are many reasons. So we really encourage you guys to share in the comments, you know, the biggest benefits you receive from incorporating Absolutely. strength training. Absolutely. And I suspect confidence, well, that's one we'll come back to here, Rick. Um, I'd like to just have us take a minute, though, first, in terms of the relevance of this uh, strength training and adding that to your overall practice of a healthy lifestyle, I, it would be understandable if there were people watching this who saying, you know, that's just not me. It's just not me. So right. let, let's talk a little bit about the relevance. This is relevant to everybody. And right. with some of the stuff you were sharing last week with Annika and I about I think you called it the weakness epidemic right. that, we, that we are uh, living in right now. Can you talk a little bit more for our audience about that? Yeah. I mean, when you think about um, living your best, and this sort of ties into something you said years ago, Rick, with the HRA, is that, you know, what does quality living look like? It's being able to do what I want to do, not what I'm limited to. I guarantee if you're not strength training, there will come a point in your life where you're going to start having to say no to things because you do not have the strength to do it. You don't have the endurance. You don't have the functional capacity and you don't feel safe doing those things because of your muscle weakness. So it doesn't matter if you're a runner, you could do any kind of aerobic activity. You will still get weaker. You will still lose muscle. Your functional ability will decline. And so it's really the recognition that now every health agency on the planet will say this. And in the last publishing of the physical activity guides for Americans, as well as the World Health Organization's guidelines, they brought an incredible urgency 
to strength train through the entire life cycle. They've got a special section on teenagers, like a special section on 90 year olds. So this is saying that this is like oxygen. You need this. If you don't have the stimulus to the muscular system, your muscles will go away. And we talked about that disuse atrophy that is so common. I mean, muscles are just proteins. It's, it is evolutionarily to our disadvantage to maintain muscles. So our body doesn't like to do it. It, rather, it would much rather get rid of it. So we have to do things that are countercultural to preserve it since we're not hunting on the Serengeti anymore. So, mm -hmm. uh, which is a simple, safe strength workout, right? Very powerful. Uh, just use atrophy. I like that. It's just basically, you don't use your muscles, they yeah. will weaken. Um, yeah. You know, in one of your articles, I think the title of it was Spinal Fitness. Yeah. No, no, it was, excuse me, oh. the inner strength and right. talk about spinal fitness. Right. Um, that one, first of all, just in terms of, of our audience, you know, we often hear uh, people will come into the program and they will have lower back pain, uh, hip pain, neck pain. That is part of the epidemic too, right, Rich, with our, our sedentary jobs and whatnot? It is. I mean, think about it where we're doing something that is not good for our body to begin with, which is sitting for many hours. When you compound that with muscles getting weaker and the inability of those muscles to do their job, I mean, think about it in very simple terms, the muscles of the spinal column, their job is to keep the spine in a normal curvature. There's a curvature to the spine and there's a reason for that in terms of disc pressure. So when they can't do that, suddenly the spine starts to be compromised I get all kinds of degenerative conditions. I get all kinds of aches and pains. So yeah, so if I'm sitting a lot and not strength training, my spine is losing on two levels um, and just strengthening those muscles can allow them to maintain the normal curvature of the spine and sort of even out the disc pressure that happens when my muscles get weak. So it's a huge issue, right? We get a ton of clients that are dealing with spine issues, neck and low back, so. Absolutely. And I can only imagine if you're dealing with pain, how, whatever that might manifest as the, the idea of, uh, I'm going to start strength training. I, I feel like we have to go back to the two points we just made. Uh, yeah. We have debunking some of the myths, less right. more here, right? That's, right? That's exactly right. In fact, I'll tell you what, the, um, if you look at the arthritis foundations data on strength training, People who strength train have lower pain scores than people that don't strength train. So if you're going to go walk and you said, hey, I need to walk to stay healthy. I got to do this, but I've got knee arthritis and it's getting bad and I'm taking all kinds of medicine for it. But man, do my knees hurt when I walk? Understandably, they do. That's a weight bearing joint. When you add muscle to your body, you're essentially adding shock absorbers. So the muscles function to do what we call dissipate ground reaction forces. So if you're stepping and you've got your whole body weight of 200 pounds being compressed into that knee joint, that number decreases when I've got muscles above and below the joint. So the muscles are there to allow the skeleton to move, of course, and they're there to protect the skeleton as well as those articular surfaces. So people with arthritis who strength train report lower pain scores than people that don't strength train. So if you have arthritis, spine, hip, knee, wherever, you should be strength training because life is less painful and you're better able to move because of that. Fantastic. So to, to reduce the pain and again, because less is more, big return on your investment. Fantastic. Um, I want to move on, um, but I will just hit on one other thing, Rich, because you've used the, the term and brought up the concept of moving, yeah. moving one's body. Yeah. One of the other things, Annika, we've certainly heard people you know, confide about how sometimes moving is difficult when they're first coming in to HMR. And I think a mistake that sometimes people make, Rich, is they attribute all of the difficulty with their excess weight. You brought up on our call, there's another factor that, that makes the moving difficult. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, well, definitely. I mean, when we think about movement in general, I think about it in a very fundamental sense. The first thing that muscles do is they're there to help us move, right? Without them, we're going nowhere. So when muscles get weaker, we are biologically requiring more of our muscle tissue to perform any given task. So we have to call this economy of movement. It's a big issue in running these days. So if I make a runner stronger, he can run a mile faster using less of his muscle tissue because each motor unit generates more force. 
So that means that I don't have to use as many of my muscles and it's less demand on the cardiovascular system. It's less uh, ground reaction force on the joints. Your body benefits on multiple levels by just gaining that strength. That walk is easier to engage in when you're stronger than any other circumstance. So, so it's the muscle weakness that is sort of exacerbating difficulty for physical activity. Uh, of course, it shows up in the joint as well, but that's called economy of movement. And you can, you know, like for you and me, Rick, we go out for a walk. The walk is invigorating. It's pretty easy. Uh, we feel good. But if someone who's substantially heavier goes out, that's a demanding task on them physically, right. physiologically. And so some of that is muscle weakness. They're having to use so much of the limited muscle mass they have to generate force because they're so weak. So this is both physiological and neurological. There's a connection between the two. Uh, but yeah, so just being weaker makes those events uh, almost impossible for some people, right? Right. So that, that then helps us move, Annika, into the, another reason why this conversation around strength training is relevant. We've talked about some of the benefits. Let's laser in on that a little bit more now, Rich. Annika, I'm wondering, we do have people who do strength train within the HMR program. Um, do we have any posts that you would want to share as we sort of move into talking about some of the benefits? Yeah. Um, yeah, we have a lot of uh, people commenting here. One that uh, Dawn posted, strength training has saved my knee joints from injury and pain for decades. Um, um, so then it goes to what you were uh, just saying, Rich. Um, yeah. Let's see here. Um, I know when last, when we were looking at the thought starter that we posted earlier, I really liked um, uh, some of the comments about posture, even mm -hmm. like a little bit to some of the things you were saying about spinal health, yeah. uh, Rich. Yeah. Well, when, when yeah. we had spoken about this last week, you had said there are health, there are health benefits across every age. So we sort of decided we kind of ripped through some different age categories here and just uh, make a point about some of the health benefits. Yeah. So we broke it down to, uh, well, if you're from your teen years to uh, say 35 years of age, which guys, you know, that happens to be my age group. So I'm very interested <laughs> in this. <laughs> so why should someone at that age, I mean, I always heard growing up the whole idea of, oh, God, you don't want to lift weights when you're younger yeah. because you could stunt your growth. So talk to us a little bit about benefits from the teens to age 35. Yeah, so let's at least get that one off the table, Rick. So that when I was growing up, that was the case, is that my father, who was a physical therapist, for heaven's sakes, didn't want his boys to strength train. Uh, <laughs> this might impair our growth. Of course, there's not a shred of evidence to support that, and we now know that that's 100% wrong. Um, what you will do is you might kill yourself if you're doing things dangerously. But um, <laughs> so, so the issue with, with young adults really is some degree of supervision, some really clear instruction, because young kids will just go bonkers if they're trying to strength train, of course. Uh -huh. So some, some, some instruction, some supervision, whether it's initial or, or ongoing. Mm -hmm. um, but we know that uh, young adults, young teenage girls in general, a benefit enormously from bone mineral density more than older women do when it comes to increasing bone mineral density and we thought the opposite for many years so we now know that if a teenage girl is strength training she's getting substantial improvements in her peak bone mass i mean we we are grown our bones grow mostly up until the age of 20 and then slowly for the next decade or so and so we hit our peak bone mass in our early 30s so there's a lot of growth happening in those teen years for, for bone tissue. And so the strength workout actually is a stimulus. It's stimulating what's called the osteoblasts in the bone itself. So mm -hmm. it upregulates uh, the, the mineral matrix synthesis. So, so that's great for, for uh, women uh, getting a, a jump on bone mass. Uh, we also know that um, strength training is effective at reducing both anxiety and depression scores in teenagers. Mm. Now, you might think, gosh, that why does that matter? Well, the suicide has been a leading cause of death in teenagers for decades. Now, I don't know if it's number two or number three right now, but it is a major issue for teenagers. So to be able to say I can go do this simple behavior that feels good and is good for me, 
I have less anxiety, I, my depression scores go down. That is a gargantuan benefit to society for, of course, many reasons. And so when we think about the fact that there's no downside when I do it properly, I can enhance growth, I can still build muscle, you can get stronger at this phase and start to develop what we talked about was that sort of early adoption of a health habit that is gonna be a lifelong behavior. Mm -hmm. All the evidence Rick says, when you look at any of the evidence today, it'll tell you, you need to strength train through the entire lifespan. We're no longer differentiating. We're saying, get started early, stay with it forever. I, may, I jokingly tell people that, you know, on the day of your funeral, get your strength workout in before your funeral so that you're <laughs> feeling good that day. So, but I yeah. like that. that's great. So you're talking, uh, that's fascinating what you just said, you know, beyond yeah. the bone health, the mental health stuff, I know you're quoting right from the science. I can yeah. only presume that the earlier points, the positive points we made, that less is more even there. Right. That just, it's just, just a, yeah. getting into a routine where that may take yeah. less time than you think. Yeah. Uh, it'd be easier than you think can reap some of the benefits that you're sharing here. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so paradoxically, yeah, teenagers, young adults can benefit enormously uh, beyond just all the other normal metabolic benefits we get from a productive strength workout, right? So, Annika, teens at 35, you actually are in this age group. <laughs> barely, barely. But <laughs> t t why do you, I know you do engage in uh, a routine of resistance and strength training. Why? Yeah. Um, a few of these benefits that you listed really resonate with me. Um, I really do feel a huge shift in my mood and my mental state, you know, when I am incorporating strength training regularly. Um, you know, it honestly feels like it helps me a lot with my body image and it just makes me feel more confident. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so I do notice a shift, um, of course, with the variety, you know, that certainly helps. We don't want to do the same thing all the time. So it, it really helps me, though, mentally, I would say, um, feel yeah. better. Yeah. Yes. yeah. I have to um, agree uh, for yeah. myself. In some ways, Rich, it's interesting. I find it very easy to uh, share why I'm so reinforced by my cardio workouts. Yeah. The, the, for me, the resistance or the strength training, it's harder for, I don't, I feel like I'm never eloquent about it. And mm. I, can, I, I can capture it like this. I mean, obviously I feel stronger, Yeah. but it's almost like with the cardio, it's like, it's in that whole idea of, uh, you know, burning calories, like it's more like a, almost like a, in an effort to keep a lower body weight, like a restrictive yeah. sort of paradigm. The resistance and strength training is the opposite for me. Yeah. It's almost like I'm building the temple. Yeah. Right. I'm laying the foundations uh, for the temple. Uh, it's true. It's, it's yeah. very different for it's me. Well, I mean, think about it. You, when we think about strength training, the, the common view is, well, I think about my muscles. Of course, I'm working my muscles. So yes, you're training your muscular system. But the thing about that is the muscles are the gateway to your cardiovascular system. If you said, I want my blood vessels to be healthier. I want my heart to be healthier. You can't do it without using your muscles. If you want your tendons to be healthier, there isn't a tendon workout. You train your muscles. If you want your bones to be healthier, you don't do the bone workout. You train your muscles. If you want the ligaments to be stronger and healthier, you train the muscles. So they are the gateway to every other system in our body. Mm -hmm. I can make my brain healthier with strength training. And so the nice thing is that when you do that productive strength workout, yes, you should feel from head to toe, your whole body feels stimulated and good. But I've just enhanced every organ system in my body and done it in a way that I'm not exposing myself to excessive force and not unnecessary stress to joints, which is so common as well. People train recklessly and they're doing more harm than good. So done properly, you should feel good. You should have no aches and pains. We tell our clients, look, the net outcome here, you get stronger, you feel better. If that's not happening, tell us because something's wrong. That should be happening all the time. Oh, that's great. That's such a great message. Let's go, let's jump through the next two uh, age groups here. We'll go uh, 35 to 55. Let's just uh, hit on a couple of highlights around health benefits associated with strength training. And then we'll talk about benefits over 55. Uh, yeah. What's to mind for you here, Rich, yep. in 35 to 55? Yeah. And I touched briefly on it earlier. So when we think about um, the, the major reason in today's society in terms of why people 
don't exercise, let's just say, just get a walk in and be active and do something, be active, um, is two things, of course, time, but then pain is a major barrier for people with osteoarthritis. And so they, once they have pain, the conventional medical treatment was to do nothing. Understandably, we didn't understand about strength training without we're going to wear our joints out. So, so now that we know strength training is beneficial, it's decreasing those pain scores, opening the door to living a more active lifestyle, both with formal activity and, and recreational activity. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that we talked about is reducing those ground reaction forces. So if you've got low back issues, part of the problem besides having you know a back that is has got some degenerative issues going on is that again every footstep that you take rick you've got a ground reaction force of two to three times your weight so if i weigh 200 that's 600 pounds of force going down my spine with every single step in wow. my hip in my knee so when i'm stronger those muscles are offloading and absorbing those forces allowing me to have less discomfort in the hips, the knees, the spine, if, if I have osteoarthritis. Um, and then of course, is the osteoporosis side of the equation. We start to, bones start to demineralize in our thirties. It's basically a straight line up. You hit peak bone mass and now you're on the downturn. So as we age, that accelerates. And so this principle, this physiological principle known as Wolf's Law, I think I, well, that was in one of the articles I gave you um, that says there's a, positive correlation between muscle strength and bone mineral density. If you have stronger muscles, your bones are more dense. I won't get into all the reasons why, but, but so yeah, protecting bone mineral density and bone mass for women who are aging, of course. And then the American Heart Association says, if you want to reap the full benefits of an active lifestyle, you need to include strength training in your lifestyle. Again, they're now on board with understanding the cardiovascular benefits of strength training, which is again, the opposite of what we thought a couple right. of decades ago. Um, you, you've mentioned a couple of times aging, aging twice. And uh, I want to talk about that as we move into people over the age of 55. And I would just po uh, pose a question to our viewers. Have you ever seen someone who may be in their fifties, but they actually look and maybe even act like they're in their seventies? Yeah, right. They probably have. Um, oh yeah. But but turn it around. Have you ever seen someone you could pick any decade in their seventies, yeah. but they actually look more and act like they're in their fifties? Yeah, yeah. And that's the healthy lifestyle and what's possible there. Let's talk about this idea of reversing uh, or slowing down, or maybe even reversing the aging yeah. process yeah. through a healthy lifestyle. But in particular, strength training. Rich, is there anything else you've you've talked about osteoporosis? You've talked about preventing. Uh, the loss of lean tissue that happens after the age of 35. Uh, yeah. What else might you say about protecting yeah. our, our, our youthful vigor, shall we say? Well, we thought for many years, Rick, and this is still true to some degree. I mean, the thinking was that as we age, we just have to sort of accept these functional losses that have been common in our society. And there is some genetic component to losing what we would call motor nerves and, and muscle fibers. So that would be the the nerve that's responsible for communicating to the muscle and then the muscle fibers themselves. So there is a biological genetic component to that, but we know with now with the study of what we call epigenetics, which is how our lifestyle in, impacts how our genes behave, we know we can downregulate down those activities. And so I can reduce the rate at which I'm losing fast twitch muscle fibers. I can reduce the rate at which I'm losing motor nerves and basically that's part, one of the components of why I stay strong as I age is I'm not losing the, the, the motor unit itself as I'm getting older. So I can, I guess the good news is I can influence my genes here. Remember when we would always talk about how 70% of your health is your lifestyle. It's yeah. true today, of course, it's even more so today. We'd say 10% is genes. We can't really play with that, but it, it doesn't matter. But now we know we can play with that genetic expression. We can upregulate good for you genes. We can downregulate bad for you genes by living a certain way. And so strength training can modify this genetic expression in terms of muscle fiber loss, as well as uh, motor unit loss. So again, you can have the muscular system of a 50 year old when you're in your seventies, which is mind blowing, but there are people that you see like that, right? It's Absolutely. Boy, that that is amazing hearing that. Talk about no longer needing to play with the the the, the hand that you were dealt. <laughs> right, 
actually that overcome that. That's tremendous. I want to, um, I have actually a book recommendation that I want to share with our viewers, but let me just ask Annika if there, if there's any comments that you want to share yeah. from the viewers or from our thought starter earlier in the week. Yeah. Um, Nancy just shared, I'm 65 and consistently mistaken for 40. I have strength trained since my twenties. <laughs> Wow. I just had my first bone density scan, that of a 30-year-old. Wow. Wow. That's yeah. impressive. That's impressive. That's really. good news, yeah. Boy, people, it's just, it's so counterintuitive. People just don't realize the fact that you actually can impact the right. aging process, slow it down, maybe even reverse it with some changes, depending on how things were going. Um, Rich, you had mentioned a term, um, it's not about chronological age. You can't change that. Next right. year, you're going to be a year later, right? Yeah. Uh, there's no getting around that. But biological age yeah. is really what right. we're talking about here, right? Yeah. yeah, without a doubt. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, uh, and, and speaking of bone mineral density, we see women like that too who uh, get improvements in their in their uh, DEXA scans, not just staying stable, but they get better in their 60s and 70s. So which is just amazing. Um, well, yeah, this is this is a uh, an unexpected sort of behavior that is delivering benefits that no one would have ever dreamed possible one or two generations later. I mean, remember the days, Rick, when the only people that should strength train are either muscle heads or professional athletes. That's it. Yes. You, you didn't need to waste time strength training because it just isn't a health habit that anyone should be thinking about. Right. Um, and and if if you want to do it. Why don't you watch Arnie in Pumping Iron? And that'll give you some motivation and a right. good good place to start. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. So listen, there are a thousand books we might recommend. I don't know, Richard, yeah. it, but I'll just say one that I have, because since we're talking about, and, and the point you just made is it's not just slowing down the aging process based on the studies you just shared, the right. possibility of reversing the aging process in some regard yeah. I have recommended this book to a lot of people, and I know yeah. there's one now for men and one for women. It's, it's really yeah. sort of taken off in the last five or six years, younger next year. I just remember reading this, and of course, you're not going to be surprised, Rich, resistance training and, and, and building strength is a part, big part of this, not all of it, but they talk yeah. about the whole gamut. But sure. it was a very inspiring book. And, uh, you know, if anyone's looking beyond your articles, I would start with your articles on edfitnessprogram.com. But just to read, Brad, brain rattling, irresistible, hilarious. If you're up for it, this book could change your life, the Washington Post. So uh, there are many uh, recommendations. That one I, I found to be particularly motivating if anyone is so yeah. inclined. No. Before we turn the corner to like how to's, and, and really this whole conversation is, probably a lot more of the what and the why. Yeah. Uh, the how-tos are things that we can maybe unpack if we can get you back in this space uh, another time. But yeah. I just want you to repeat for people who may have missed it. Yeah. So many people are interested in either losing weight, mm -hmm. managing weight. Could you come back to and just summarize again yeah. this whole concept of the excess post-exercise oxygen consumption or the fact that you still burn calories yeah. after you've finished the resistance or strength training. Yeah. So when you, again, this is if you're strength training properly, which means it's an intense workout, it's brief and you're basically damaging your muscles. We call that the training stimulus. If we were to do a muscle biopsy of your bicep, Rick, after your workout, we would see tears in the, in the contractile protein. So that's muscle damage. That's what the workout does. Your body is going to adapt to that stress and that damage and try to fix it and heal it. And so it does so by building more tissue because you were just threatened with this damage. And this is the compensatory response to that damage. So all proteins behave this way in our body. Our bones do it. So we get this compensatory response that lasts for three or more days after the strength workout where metabolic rate is elevated about 7% of basal metabolism. For, so for me, if I do the math on my numbers, I'm getting another, I think it's about 130, 140 calories a day over the next three to four days after my strength workout, doing nothing, just living, right? That's so that's, uh, that's significant over time when you add that up. The other thing that happens, Rick, is that you 
remember the lean mass, and this has been overstated for years, but the lean mass, the skeletal muscle does use more calories than you know, adipose tissue, body fat. So if we look at the energy use of a pound of body fat, it's about three, two to three calories a day. And, and the lean mass is a little more than double that. So it's not some crazy number, but it is an increase in energy use by being having more muscle tissue on your body. And then that's a forever effect as long as you maintain that lean mass, right? What, what a powerful argument to uh, sample uh, strength training, Rich, this mm -hmm. idea of uh, continuing to burn calories after the workout is over. Fantastic. Yeah. 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 So the the uh, community is um, looking for how tos. They really want to find out how to get started with the yeah. strength training and looking for tips here. Yeah, yeah. So um, how do you want to start this, Rich? One of the things I, I think that as part of the how tos, I know that this was earth shattering for me is this whole idea of uh, and two of your articles on your website speak to the the slow revolution. That's right. certainly part of the how-tos, but uh, right. take it away in terms of your yeah. thought on uh, getting started. Yeah, I'll, I'll share a couple of key points that are probably significant for most people. And that is number one, always train your entire body at one time. So now, Rick, I know you like to do your daily habits, which I wouldn't disagree with that. Yeah. Um, and I know why that works for you. So that could be good. But in general, for people in general, they have the option between doing a split workout, splitting body parts out, and then doing a full body workout for sake of efficiency, we're going to always recommend do a full body workout. I can, you know, think about my whole body in 20 minutes. That's my whole body. I don't need to come back to the gym tomorrow, or the next day to train my back or my legs or my shoulders. I got everything done in one day. So think in terms of the whole body as a system. And um, when it comes to the number of exercises to train your whole body, it does not take a lot. You can get your whole body trained in six to eight exercises if you choose the right exercises. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a couple, uh, well, I'll stop there for the moment, but so full body workout, I'd say six to 10 exercises is more than enough to get the full body addressed. Mm -hmm. And then the other big surprise is just do one set. Don't do two sets, three sets, four sets. Um, and the reason for that is motor recruitment is sequential. So if I look at stimulating muscle fibers and I'm starting to do bicep curls and the first few reps are easy and the last few reps are hard, the most enduring fibers are recruited first. Those are slow twitch muscle fibers. Then the stronger, more powerful ones, the fast twitch are recruited last as force production goes up. So, uh, so I don't need multiple sets here. Look at the literature here. The second set is not any better than the first set, and so on with the third set, and so on. You can you're wasting time with these multiple set workouts. Wow. Work hard on one set, move on to the next exercise. That's why I can train my whole body in 20 minutes. So it's a revolutionary idea because we've been just so it's been so indoctrinated into do multiple sets, Rich. It's amazing to hear that, but yet you the, yeah. the biological mechanism you just shared that make that makes sense. Right, right, right. So, um, so right, train your whole body, six to 10 exercises, do one set, and then train as hard as you can train. Not everyone is going to be able to go to this point of muscle failure where you can't get the last rep, um, uh, but train hard. It should be challenging. That's the whole reason why you're doing a strength workout. You need to stimulate the muscles. It's not about doing a moderate workout that is easy and then you check it off. Okay, I strength train, great. That's not how it works. You just wasted your time doing an easy workout. So, so work as hard as you can work. Not everyone may have the mental strength to get to that muscle failure, but get as close as you can. Understand that intensity matters and don't just sort of go moderately into your workout. So yep. um, that makes a difference. Um, people are asking about the particular exercises. Now, I know that you know you have a bias, as you should, because yeah. you get to train people in person and you have a facility. Sure. You, you, that are that very specific. Um, yeah. But before you answer that, though, could you, this seems like this one last fundamental uh, idea that I got from your articles, which was this idea of doing the reps fast, right? right? Not exactly be in your best interest. Just a quick point on that. And then we can talk about the specific exercise. Yeah. Fully sure. So, um, so faster is less effective because you're sort of offloading the muscle at some point during the movement because you've got so much momentum. There's a point where it's hard, then there's a point where it gets easy. 
We call that unloading the muscle. So we've got this inefficient way to generate mechanical work. So the better way to do it is just slow down. Most people make this mistake. They, they feel like they do what we call chase, they chase repetitions. If they're getting fatigued, the next rep is even faster to squeeze it off. And now I'm more fatigued, you gotta go even faster to get that next rep. The goal is not to do reps, guys. The goal is to fatigue the muscle. So just mm -hmm. slow down. Don't worry about the number of reps you do. Just move at a slow cadence. I'd say in general, if you're training, if you're doing your body weight or free weights or most traditional machines, I'd say a five by five speed is phenomenal. Five seconds up, five seconds down. That's plenty mm. slow enough to reduce most of the peak force that we see when people are throwing weights around, yeah. uh, risking injury. Yeah. So, I mean, we do 10, 10, as you know, Rick, but we've got specialized equipment. that's very well engineered for that purpose. But just any fitness center you go to, you can do five, five. That's a great speed to keep it slow and safe and intense and challenging to the target yes. muscle. So five minutes doing the exercise and then five minutes undoing the exercise, if you will. Five seconds. Yeah. Uh, excuse me. Five seconds. Excuse yeah. me. Uh, yeah. yeah it's, mentally, it's actually hard to do that because we're sort of conditioned to want to yeah. do as many reps as you can as quickly right. as you can. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah. so Rich, someone, um, one of our colleagues, Erin, just said that she, it's really important to her to be accountable to her trainer. Yeah. So um, right. what, how, you know, people, if they're so motivated from this conversation, you would probably, I'm guessing, recommend that yeah. people sample coaching and get some supervision on this. Um, sure. Maybe you could speak to that. And I, I don't know if you're able to provide some suggestions even in the home for people. Right. Well, there's no arguing that just as in with the weight management, having a coach in a program makes a gargantuan difference. That HMR is a, a great example of that. Uh, same thing with strength training. The, 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 the current evidence shows that when you are supervised in your workout, that's actually more important than anything else. If you're being supervised, you will automatically work harder because you've got someone looking over your shoulder, giving you feedback, mm -hmm. which makes sense. And then you've got all the other things. It means you, you know, you're stricter, you have better form, you're progressive, all the nuts and bolts are taken care of when you're being professionally supervised. So if people do well with supervision. I'd say if someone wanted to make an investment with the trainer and maybe learn some things and get a little bit of supervision and get started and say, hey, um, here's what I need to know and learn and, and get some guidance. And then they could apply that to some self-guided workouts if they don't want to continue to invest that money. I mean, depending upon who you're working with, it can be very expensive. So, yes, uh, but supervision does matter. Um, and uh, there's just no reason why it wouldn't. But now we have research on that exact topic. You even have a term for, I love the term, workout skills. Yeah, and right. Having yes. a su supervision, at least up front, helps right. to develop those. Say a little bit more about that for people. Yeah. So, I mean, first off, you have to, let's say you said, okay, I'm going to do this exercise. Great. Well, now, how do I do this exercise? What is the range of motion? What kind of form should I maintain? What speed should I have? What do my transitions look like? Um, there's a lot of questions that go into properly executing that exercise. And it's so easy to do them wrong. And when you do them wrong, now you're just wasting the whole time invested in the activity. It's not like a walk where you, it's hard to do a walk wrong, you know, but here a lot of things can go wrong. So we teach people what the expectations are on those four workout skills and they're constantly being coached and they have to develop the ability to maintain those skills while their muscles are on fire. So that, that takes time and practice. And so, I mean, Again, by its very nature, strength training is uncomfortable. It should be uncomfortable, but thankfully it's brief and infrequent. That's what makes it a doable piece to the lifestyle. So, yeah. so but, you're, you're definitely a hard nod to get, uh, even if it's short term, make the investment yeah. for all the reasons we've talked about, what a return on the investment, uh, right. some strength training, get, get someone to help you yeah. establish those workout skills. Etc. Yeah. Rich, what if someone's not quite ready to make that that leap uh, yeah. into a facility or with a one-on-one -on -one coaching yeah. uh, format? Sure. Do you have any next steps that you would recommend for people? Yeah, I mean, if, if you're looking at some level of sort of programming, there are a lot of options online, Rick. And I know I used Peloton the other day. They they have you can pay, I think it's 10 or 12 bucks a month and get a subscription to their strength training program. 
and have dozens of programs to choose from that you can you know, be guided through from a virtual coach and so on. It's mm -hmm. not a live session where you're getting real-time feedback, but you have a program to follow. You have someone leading you through it. They're providing some coaching pointers and so on. That could be a pretty affordable way to have an option that gives you some structure uh, to walk through. Uh, there's books that I like. Um, one in particular, in fact, I have it right here. It's entitled Strength Training Past 50. This mm -hmm. is... Uh, by Dr. Wayne Westcott. He's a prolific strength training scientist. He's out in Massachusetts, actually. So, uh, but, you know, gives you some, some free weight options, some machine options, some other things, some of the process to follow. Um, and then, of course, uh, as you mentioned, the more people learn about strength training in general, just sort of understanding it and its benefits, that's always a good catalyst to keep people going. Just like anything, you know, like we learn more and then we were engaged in that and that knowledge and that habit. So um, yeah. it also makes sense. So that's a great recommendation. I know he's a real leading light has been for decades in this, uh, in this area. So I'd like to repeat that strength training past 50 would yep. be the recommendation there. Yep. Uh, yeah. Great. Well, we um, we're nearing the top of the hour. Uh, we, we, really it's obvious there's just so much more to actually say about this i think some of the key points though i'm glad annika that we started with the myths as we did because that really led into what i think might be the key takeaway of yeah. this whole conversation rich let me know if you agree but it's really this concept of less actually being more with strength training that's right it's an extraordinary thought that's right no you're absolutely right if people can just digest that single nugget then they it gives them access to that habit. That's yeah, right. It's great. All right. All right. Well, I'm going to um, bring this to a close with yet one final book reference. <laughs> Three mm -hmm. book references in one Facebook Live. That's record, Annika. Um, this one is a book that um, has been brought up more than once in recent weeks at HMR. It's actually not a strength training book, Rich. It's, it's called Essentialism. Ah. And it's about achieving maximum productivity in your life. And a big theme of this book, though, yeah. as it relates to productivity as a thing, is doing more with less, which mm. so I had to mention that. Yeah. But there's actually one other concept in this book, and it's actually a lesson that, that's presented in the book, and it's got a soundbite to it. It's the, the lesson is protect the asset. Mm. Their point is the best way to make the maximum contribution in your world, whether it's your work or it's certainly with your family and with your loved ones, yeah. you to be your best you is to protect the asset. And that asset is, of course, you. Interesting. So to everyone, the work you're doing with HMR to practice a healthy lifestyle, you're already protecting the asset. Tonight's conversation introduced another way to strengthen the investment even more, the investment that you're making in yourself strength training. Rich, can I ask you publicly, are you willing to come back and have a follow-up yeah. conversation at some point in this space with us? Yeah, I'd love to do it, Rick. There's lots of nuts and bolts that we can unpack. Yeah. Love That'd be wonderful. Back. This has been great. I see a lot of really fabulous uh, comments in the uh, feed here. Uh, tremendous. want to thank all of you who spent the time uh, with us for this conversation. Annika, thanks for joining us for this. We hope this conversation was helpful. We hope that it got you thinking and we will re be revisiting it again. So good night, everyone. Have a great week. Thanks for being with us. Bye. Thanks, Rich. Bye. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.